Hello everyone, welcome to the second chapter called AP Precal. This is named zeros of polynomials. So in this particular chapter, we will study what polynomials are. We will look into where their zeros land, and what the properties of those zeros are, how the polynomial behaves between zeros, and the various other characteristics of polynomials. All right. So we will also look into the behavior of polynomials when we plot them on a graph, like their shapes. We will look into the solutions of a few general polynomials, like the linear polynomial and the quadratic polynomial. We will also look into how complex numbers behave when they are obtained as a solution of questions all right relating to polynomials so let us begin to first understand what polynomials are we must understand what algebraic expressions are to understand what algebraic expressions are we must understand what terms are now what are terms terms are any combination of a variable or a constant okay it could be a variable into a constant it could be just the constant it could be just a variable with a power all right so these are terms now you have heard about like terms and unlike terms right so in that respect terms should always be separated by a plus or minus because if you're multiplying two terms it will just condense into one term right so if i multiply 6x and 3 i'll get 18x which is basically one term but 6x plus 3 are two terms right 6x and 3 so any combination of terms separated by a plus or minus produces an algebraic expression now an example of algebraic expression is highlighted in the notes so you can see fx is equal to x plus 1 by x this is an algebraic expression all right for an algebraic expression to be a polynomial we must ensure that all the powers of the variables that are present here are whole numbers okay so here we have x to the power 1 which is fine a whole number and then 1 by x which is x to the power minus 1 that is not a whole number right so the expression that we have on the screen will be just an expression it cannot be classified as a polynomial okay so for a polynomial every power of the variable should be a whole number pay no attention to the coefficients all right they could be rational irrational square roots whatever you want but the power should always be whole number okay for example root 2x square is a polynomial x to the power root 2 is not a polynomial okay because root 2 is not a whole number fine so the general form of polynomials is given by px is equal to an x to the power n plus an minus 1 x to the power n minus 1 plus dot 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 so this is the general form of a nth degree polynomial all right n degree polynomial fine so these are the coefficients all right uh, this is not a coefficient this is a constant all right and you have decreasing powers of x an is non zero since i already stated that this is a degree n polynomial okay so degree n polynomial means the coefficient associated with x to the power n should be non zero otherwise it will be degree n minus 1 and so on Okay, so the highest exponent or power of the variable with a non-zero coefficient is known as degree of a polynomial. Okay, so that is denoted by degree of p x. So I have given an example of a cubic polynomial. If you take n equal to three here, you will obtain this general cubic form. Okay, so a three x cube plus a two x square plus a one x plus a naught. All right. Now we will look into some of the common polynomials. Take n equal to zero. At n equal to zero, the general form of the polynomial reduces to just a naught. Right, a zero. Now a zero is basically a constant polynomial. All of the constants that we know are classified as constant polynomials. They are under the ambit of the definition of a polynomial, but they do not follow any theorems related to polynomials. So the fundamental theorem of algebra, the factor theorem, the remainder theorem, the polynomials are not going to follow these. All right, the constant polynomials. So since the constant polynomials are not going to follow these anyway, so we just bucket all the constants as constant polynomials and keep them aside. Whenever we have to define a function relating to, whenever we have to define a, a theorem relating to polynomials, we just exclude them anyway, just by setting degree p x greater than equals to one or greater than zero. So as we make that restriction, we eliminate the possibility of constant polynomials getting used in theorems, which they wouldn't obey anyway. So why? keep that within them all right so constant polynomials rejected from theorems and we will start our study of polynomials from n equal to 1 so from n equal to 1 you have degree of px is equal to 1 which means px is equal to a1 x plus a0 this is a linear polynomial this is called a linear polynomial because when you plot it it produces a straight line all right so line linear that logic okay so if you set it to 0 a1 x plus a0 is equal to 0 then you will get a general solution for all x every linear polynomial is solvable all right so you can solve it to find the value of x now if you plot it you will get a straight line the straight line will have an angle with the axis and for that angle you can calculate the tan theta which is a slope also the slope can be found in the coordinate geometry way so this is basically y2 minus y1 by x2 minus x1 you take two points on the straight line subtract their y coordinates subtract their x coordinates you should get the slope if you think in terms of trigonometry this thing is the same the y2 minus y1 is the same as change in y which is known as delta y x2 minus x1 is the same as change in x known as delta x and tan a will be del y by del x you can calculate a by taking the tan inverse on the other side all right so at n equals to two, you have a quadratic polynomial a quadratic polynomial is given by px is equal to a2 x squared plus a1 x plus a0 provided a2 is non-zero right so i'll have to add it a2 is non-zero now you will find that uh, the general form of quadratic equation given in your book is given something like this ax squared plus bx plus c where a is non-zero it is the same thing right you, you are just naming the variables differently so nothing will change in the theory we'll just use different names for all the formulas all right use whichever formula is given in your book and that will be it so for n equal to 2 we will produce a quadratic polynomial and the quadratic polynomials are parabola when you draw them all right so the parabola could be opening upwards for that you will have a greater than 0 the parabola could be opening downwards if you have a less than 0 i'm talking about this k all right so just by looking at the parabola you will know which direction it faces if a is positive upwards if a is negative downwards all right now we will do a much more detailed study of these polynomials under quadratic equations but from the graph you can see that we can either have these polynomials like the way in which i have plotted them on the graph or you can have them just touching the x axis or you cannot have them touching the x axis at all so in this case you will have no solutions in this case you will have one solution and in these cases you will have two solutions all right so the solutions are also known as roots and in case of polynomials they're known as zeros so a polynomial can have zeros if you set the polynomial to zero then you will obtain an equation the equation will have solutions or roots okay just make sure that you understand these terms separately they both okay all three of them imply the same thing 
but they are used in different contexts. We use solutions and roots for equations, and we use zero for polynomials. Okay, when you set a polynomial to zero, you get an equation, and from that equation, you can get solutions or roots. But the solutions or roots that you obtain are relating to the equation. If you think about in terms of a polynomial, you have a zero of a polynomial. A zero of a polynomial is the setting of a polynomial to zero and then obtaining the solution. All right. So for polynomials, we have zeros. For equations, we have roots and solutions. Remember it. All right. Uh, if you write solution of a polynomial, that is a problem. If you write zero of an equation, that is also a problem, a technical problem. We know what you mean, but you have to use the correct terms, right? Uh, Concentrate on this fundamental theorem of algebra. Fundamental theorem of algebra says a real polynomial of degree n has at most n zeros. So that means for a quadratic equation, it is having a degree of two, right? So for a degree two polynomial, it will have at most two zeros. So at most two zero means it can have one zero, it can have no zeros, it can have two zeros. I showed you all of the cases, right? So if it has no zero, it will be a quadratic polynomial plotted like this, never touching the x-axis. Remember, a polynomial only has a zero if it touches the x-axis, okay? Because if it touches the x-axis, then you have f y is equal to zero, right? Or f x is equal to zero. That is basically the solution. So intersecting the x-axis means you have a zero. And intersecting the x-axis twice means you have two zeros. So this is the case with two zeros. The case with one zero will look like this. We have studied this under quadratic equations. When d square minus four is zero, you have equal roots. So this will be the equal root. Okay. Then you have also studied the case when d square minus four is less than zero. The discriminant is less than zero. So this will be a case like this. All right. There will be no intersection of the x-axis and the solutions are imaginary. Now I told you I will introduce you to a bit of complex numbers. So let's say you have this simple equation x square plus one is equal to zero. How do you solve it? You have x is equal to plus minus root over minus one. Now this root over minus one is given as i. All right. So by this logic, you should have i square is equal to minus one. So if this is minus one and this is i, so if you square it, this square root will go away, and you will end up as i square is equal to minus one. And if i square is equal to minus one and I square both sides, I'll get i to the power four is equal to one, right? Okay. Now complex numbers are denoted as a plus b i, where a and b are real numbers and i is this imaginary number. All right. Technically, all numbers are imaginary. We just call these imaginary numbers because th that is opposite of real numbers, right? So you have real numbers, the things that you can see, touch, write, and then you have imaginary numbers, complex numbers. So in terms of mathematics, when we write them down, we denote them as complex numbers, but they are called imaginary numbers also. All right. So you can use either expression, whichever one is given in your school textbook. All right. So a plus b i, complex number, and there could be a few many different types of complex number sums, right? So for example, you might be asked what is the value of i to the power two and twenty five. Remember, i to the power four is one, right? Because i was this plus minus one square root over minus one, that is i. So if i is square root over minus one and i square is minus one and i to the power four is one, then any four multiple in the power should give you one. So I can write i to the power two and twenty five as i to the power two and twenty four into i. So this is the this is a multiple of four, right? So this is i to the power four to the power five zero six. Now this is one and one to the power anything is one, so you will get one into i, which is equal to i. So you will get some simple problems like this, all right? Now or a quadratic equation, you could have a quadratic equation like this, and if you apply the quadratic formula, you'll get minus b plus minus root over b square minus four ac. So b square would give you mm, b square would give you nine, and minus four ac would give you uh, minus four into two into five. So nine minus forty, you'll get minus thirty one. So remember, when you have minus thirty one square root, you will write it as root thirty one into root over minus one. So this root over minus one will be replaced by i, and you will get an imaginary solution. So this complex or imaginary solution has a plus minus in it, right? So you will get a plus version and a minus version. Now these plus and minus versions you have studied in irrational numbers. When you study thirds and irrationals, right? You know that a plus minus root b. This format is known as a conjugate format because if you add them, the irrational part disappears. If you multiply them, the irrational part also goes away. So there is the same logic in case of complex numbers as well. So a plus minus root b. These are called complex irrational numbers. A plus minus b i. These are called conjugate complex numbers. And as you can observe, since this cannot be further simplified, complex roots will always occur in conjugate pairs, and irrational roots will also do the same. Okay. So if you have, if you know that your equation is of degree three, three. Remember this degree, degree three. Then if you have to have a complex root. You will have to have it conjugate as well, right? So conjugate and the original number will make two. So complex roots will always occur in pairs itself and its conjugate. So for an odd polynomial, a polynomial of odd degree, you are always going to have at least one real root, right? Because even if there are complex roots, they will be in pairs. So let's say you have a polynomial of degree five, you can have two complex roots, two complex roots with their conjugates and with this conjugate, they will make four. The remaining one has to be real because it cannot be complex and in fact it cannot be irrational either, right? Because if it is irrational, then it has to have its conjugate as well. But there are only five because the fundamental theorem of algebra restricts us. From having a sixth root in a degree five polynomial equation, all right. So that is a fun way in which you can be asked some problems. Okay. So I have just uh, given ways of multiplying complex numbers. These are the general ways. But when you are multiplying conjugate complex numbers, you should just be multiplying as a plus b and a minus b whole square. Okay. Sorry, a plus b into a minus b, which gives you a square minus b square. You are mostly going to use this in conjugate complex numbers. But I have still given you how you can work with general complex multiplication and general irrational multiplication. If you need it. You can pause the video here and note it down. Otherwise, let us move on. This is the corollary that I talked to you about, right? Every odd degree polynomial has at least one real root because complex roots are in conjugate pairs, right? So if you have the roots as three and root five, then your polynomial, original polynomial, would turn out to be x minus three into x minus root five into x plus root five because this root five will occur with its conjugate minus root five. So this will be the polynomial whose roots are three and root five. All right. Now we have a question according to this. It says a polynomial p x has the following roots minus two, one plus root three, and five i. Write the equation of the function of the lowest possible degree. So this is a root. This is one of the complex roots. I'll have to mention its conjugate as well. This is one of the, I'm sorry. This is the irrational root, right? So I'll have its conjugate as well. That's one minus root three. This is a complex root. I should have its conjugate as well, which is minus five i, right? So this also says remember to expand any factors con containing radicals or imaginary units, right? So you don't have to multiply the entire thing. You just have to get rid of the irrational parts or radicals and the imaginary parts or i, 
Okay, so this will be our original polynomial. So minus two from that we'll get x plus two. From one plus root three, I'll get x minus technically bracket one plus root three, but I can remove this brackets and distribute the negative sign. So I'll get one minus one minus root three, and then I have x minus one minus root three. Again, distributing the negative, I'll have minus here and plus there. All right. Similarly, I'll have x minus five i into x plus five i. So if I multiply these two, I'll sh I should get x square minus twenty five i square. Now i square is minus one, so this will give me x square plus twenty five, right? And I'll have to do this multiplication separately. Well, I can just multiply this as a plus b and a minus b. So I'll get this term x square minus two x minus two. Ultimately, uh, compiling all of this, this will be the polynomial that I should get. Okay, p x is equal to x plus two, which will give me the root minus two. X square minus two x minus two will give me these two conjugates one plus root three and one minus root three, and x square plus twenty five will give me these two conjugates five i and minus five i. All right. So this will be a degree one to five polynomial. All right. Okay, so here is a sum of complex numbers. The reciprocal of the number i. So one by i, I can multiply i on both sides. So I'll just get minus i. This is option A. All right, very easy problems. You can, you will hopefully find them in your non-calculator section. Okay, next part. All right, if p by q is a rational root, so far we were looking at irrational roots, right? Irrational roots and complex roots. Now, if this is a rational root, then we can restrict our search into certain possibilities. Okay, so if p by q is a rational root with integer coefficients, p must be a factor of the constant term, q must be a factor of the leading term. Leading coefficient, all right, and p and q should be relatively prime. So the GCD of p and q should be one. It's safe, as some people call it. So let me illustrate this with an example. So f x is given as two x cube minus seven x cube plus three x plus twelve. P by q, if that is a root, then p should divide twelve and q should divide two. So if p divides twelve, my options are plus minus one, two, three, four, five, six. No, not five. One, two, three, four, six, and twelve. If q divides two, my options are plus minus one, plus minus two. Now I have to create combinations from these, provided I keep GCD p and q is equal to one. That means I reduce it to the lowest terms, all right. So for plus minus one. P, I'll get one by one and one by two because I have to keep it in P by Q, right? So I'll get plus minus one divided by plus minus two. So I'll get plus minus one first and plus minus half next. For plus minus two, I'll get two divided by one and two divided by two. So I'll get two and then plus minus one again. I'm not repeating that since it's already there. Same with three, I'll get three by one and three by two. I have three by two. Same with four, I'll get four by one and four by two. Now four by one is four, which I put here. Four by two is two, which I already have. Six, six by one is six, which I put here. Six by two is three, which I already have. Twelve by one is twelve, which I put here. Twelve by two is six, which I already have. So these are the collection of possible roots. All of these are not the roots, but whatever rational roots you are supposed to find, you will find among these. All right. So similarly, we have one more exercise. If uh, I'll just scroll a bit. Up so that you can pause the video and try the exercise on your own if you want. So f x is equal to six x cube plus fourteen x square minus twenty five x plus four. How many possible distinct rational roots does f x have? So again, we're looking into p by q. P should divide four and q should divide six. Figure it out, you'll get your answer. All right. So p divides four, q divides six. So p could be plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus four. Q could be all of these. Just look into the combinations. You should able, you should be able to get your answer. Do not count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight is also an option. You have plus minus, so it will be doubled. Sixteen will be the answer. All right. Do not make the rookie mistake here. After calculating everything, you marking eight will be a very sad mistake. All right. So be very aware. Do not fall into that trap. All right. A polynomial of degree n has at most n minus one turns. All right, remember this. These turns are known as extrema. We will learn more about this when we learn calculus. But for now, uh, we know from the fundamental theorem of algebra that a polynomial of degree n has at most n zeros. Right. So for there to be n zeros, if a polynomial crosses the x-axis once, okay, let's assume that it. Okay, I have the diagram. Right. So I'll show you with the diagram. So let's assume that the polynomial crosses the x-axis from below. Okay. It has a zero here. Now, if it wants to have one more zero, it should be able to turn somewhere and come down. Right. Otherwise, it will just keep going above the x-axis and it will never come back, and so it will never have another zero. So if it wants to have another zero, it should be able to turn back. Now the point where it turns is the thing that we count n minus one. So here it has to when it touches the x-axis three times or cuts the x-axis three times, we see that it turns twice. Okay, so that is an example of a polynomial of degree n has at most n minus one. It can be lesser because I can have something like this where the root and the extrema are the same point, right? So there will be only two two turns, but there will be a common extrema and a root. Okay, here there are three roots and two extremas. I can also have a root and an extrema common at the same place. All right. So when you are counting them, be aware of this. That is what the next problem deals with. All right. So next problem deals with uh, a function which is given. How many relative extrema? So how many roots are here? How many maximum roots are possible? Uh, we have to calculate the degree of the polynomial. So one from here, two from here, one, two, three, three from here, six, and one, seven. So this is a degree seven polynomial. So at most six turns. Now we have to see these six turns lead to how many extrema. So what are the roots here? Well, I can just set it to zero, right? And I'll get x equal to zero, x equal to three, x equal to minus three, and x equal to six. So I plot them all on this line. Minus three zero in order, of course. Minus three zero, three six. So to have a solution. Let us assume. Okay, this is we, we don't need to assume anything. The polynomial has a negative coefficient, right? So it should rise from below. So when it rises from below and it has a solution at x equal to minus three, it has to turn in between minus three and zero. So one turn here, at zero, again it will cross the x-axis and it will turn once, right? Between zero and three, that will be your second turn, right? Second extrema, and at three you have a square, right? So square means here you will not be crossing the x-axis; you will just be touching the x-axis because square turns are never negative, right? So you will have to stay above the x-axis. So whenever the function turns here, it does not go below the x-axis; it just turns from here itself. Okay, it. It will not turn like this. It will turn like this. The turn will happen on the axis, not below the axis. So in that case, the location of the root and the extrema will be the same. So one, one, one. We have three extrema so far. All right. The next turn will be between three and six. Okay. So between three and six, and then it will escape. All right. It will never come back again because it has already crossed the number of roots. All right. So how many did we count? One, two, the common one, and the other one. So four. All right. Four extrema in total here. Okay. 
the next question state the max possible number of imaginary zeros of this polynomial now this is a degree 5 polynomial so degree 5 polynomial means you will have exactly four maximum zeros because you cannot have three because three into two will be six that is not allowed by the fundamental theorem of algebra why into two because complex roots are in conjugate pairs all right why not two four or zero because it could have zero but then i say max right so maximum would be four so three or one is not possible three is not possible because these are odd numbers and you have the complex numbers in pairs so we will either have b or e since it says max we will mark option e all right now yeah so all of these are just notes for students this is what i explained to you earlier that equations have root solutions or answers polynomials have zeros they are the same thing when we think about it but you will have to write it differently in different cases okay this is th this just depends on technical writing and this green bit is the explanation of this question all right so if you do have any doubts let me know in the comment section and we will also in the next video look into chapter 3 in which we will study a bit more on rational functions and other different types of polynomials okay so in this video here thank you for joining take care and i'll see you in the next one bye